I don't like talking about money. Um, <laughs> I think because I'm a pastor and um, let's face it, there are a lot of charlatans out there, you know, that call themselves pastors or preachers flying around in private jets and everything that are um, just milking people for money that um, give the gospel ministry a bad name. And uh, because of those charlatans, uh, and I would denounce that kind of thing, you know, wholeheartedly, um, you know, give some of a, the rest of us a bad name. And and so maybe I'm a little overly sensitive to that. I'm always afraid somebody's, if I talk about money, people are going to think that I'm just, I'm just personally after their money, you know. And, uh, of course, the people that know me know that nothing can be further from the truth. Um, uh, for those that don't know me, I'll just go ahead and say that I've pastored a church now for uh, 26 years, a small little church uh, out in a rural community, uh, not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, and so, uh, no, I'm not in it, in it for the money. Um, but so I have to repent sometimes and say, you know, the Bible talks about money quite a bit. And so uh, I to be a faithful uh, pastor and helping uh, the people rightly divide the word of truth, I need to really talk about money uh, a little bit more often, even though it's uncomfortable for me because of, um, you know, the, the, the misconceptions sometimes that are out there. But I don't want to err on the other side, and oftentimes I do that. So I'll go ahead and repent of that and mention it before we get started. But I want to dive in today to this topic of stewardship. We are, if you're watching this and this is the first uh, video that you're watching, it is part of a series that I'm doing on the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is our confessional statement at Lakeshore Baptist Church, our doctrinal statement of the, it's the doctrinal statement of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And today we're going to look at article number 13 on stewardship. Uh, I, I did think it was kind of funny. Uh, a lot of people look at lucky number 13, we're going to talk about money. You take that for whatever you, it's worth. But anyway, uh, enough joking around. I want to dive right into this um, text that we have in front of us because I think it's, it's helpful to think about uh, stewardship in uh, from a lot of different angles. And so let's go ahead and you can see the description there in the uh, video. I'll place it below. The, the text says of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, article number 13, says, God is the source of all blessings, temporal and spiritual. All that we have and are, we owe to him. And so I think it's a great place to start talking about stewardship. Right out of the bat, right out, uh, saying that everything we have it comes from God. Everything we have comes from God. Spiritual things, temporal things, physical things, everything comes from God. We've got to start out there or else we're going to get uh, sidetracked very easily. Um, and, and and so we have to get beyond that toddler stage that says, you ever notice that a lot of toddlers, babies, the, some of the first words, one of the first words they learn is, Mine, <laughs> mine. You know they're, they're playing in a in the uh, nursery and uh, they're playing with a toy, and another kid wants to play with a toy, and they're like mine. And so we we need to mature past that and recognize that everything that we have is not ultimately ours. Uh, if we're a Christian, we understand that that it's ultimately God's, and we are His stewards. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. We, that's what we're talking about the. Uh, doctrine of stewardship or the topic of stewardship. And so the next sentence here uh, sa says, says Christians, and this is specifically speaking of Christians, Christians have a spiritual debtorship to the world, to the whole world. Oh, there's three things that it, that's going to say in this sentence. A spiritual debtorship to the world. Let's go ahead and look at those individually. A spiritual debtorship to the whole world. Now, to be honest with you, I had to kind of scratch my head a little bit to, uh, with this terminology of a debtorship to the world. I've heard it used before, and it's actually it is a biblical concept that Christians have a debt to the world. Now you might say, wait a minute, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, now don't get confused about using that terminology of debtorship or debt in the sense of a loan and you're paying back a loan. You know, uh, or, or somebody did something for you, now you owe them uh, kind of thing. Uh, I don't think that's really what, what's going on here. It's not like the, the world's done something for us and now we owe them back. Uh, that, that's not what, 
we're talking about here. We're talking about, and I was trying to think of an illustration, and so I thought thought of this. My wife, for example, my wife loves kids, um, and so she's always playing around with kids, and and she likes to give them candy and stuff like that. Yeah, she's that lady, right? And so let's suppose she had a handful of candy, and she was going to give it to a kid. You know, maybe she has nine pieces of candy, and she's going to give it to them. Now, she you know, might give it to them and say, oh, now... Um, there's nine pieces of candy there. You have uh, two siblings, and so there's three of y'all. You need you need to share, and so you can have three pieces and give three pieces to your brother and give three pieces to your sister. And so I'm gonna give them all to you, but you need to share with your brothers and sisters. You see, so as soon as she gives that candy to that child uh, and and makes that um, that gives those that that um, those directions, then that child now is a debtor to his siblings in a sense, you see. And so the same, because he's supposed to give it to them. He's supposed to share with them. He has an obligation. He's a debtor. And so I, I think that's kind of where, where the, the doctrinal statement here is coming from when it says that we have a, a, a debtorship to the world. It's that God has blessed us and we have therefore an obligation to bless others, you see. And so, uh, and so there, there's, there's that, and it kind of modifies that or expands on that a little bit in the next, um, uh, little phrase here. We have a holy, um, trust ship in the gospel. We've been entrusted, a trust ship, um, uh, in, in the gospel. We've, we've been entrusted with the gospel. God's given us the gospel. Now, when God gives us the gospel, this is language straight from um, the Apostle Paul talking about to Timothy that uh, guard the trust. And so if we've been given the gospel, we don't take the gospel and put it in a locker and lock it up and just keep it for ourselves. No, we, we have an obligation to share that, you, you see. And so we've been we've been, been given a stewardship, not only of temporal uh, physical things, and we'll talk about money in a minute, and temporal things in a minute, as well as our time, actually our time, talent, and uh, financial things, but even spiritual things, but even spiritual things like the gospel, that uh, the gospel has been given to us as believers. We've received the good news of the gospel, which is that mankind is a sin, is a, are sinners. We are individual as sinners. We have sinned against the holy God. We deserve God's wrath, but God in his grace came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin of all who would repent of their sins and trust in Christ. On the third day, he rose from the grave, proving that he is victorious over sin, health, and the, and the grave, and that that sacrifice was accepted uh, by God. And so that's the good news of the gospel that we've been entrusted with. And it's our obligation to share that or to spread that to the world. And so we have a debtorship uh, to the whole world. We have an entrustship in the gospel. And thirdly, the sentence says, and a binding stewardship in their possessions, in Christians' possessions. We have a stewardship. And so there's that word uh, that's the topic for today, stewardship. So let's talk about that word stewardship for a second. The word stewardship means that you have been granted responsibility for someone else's possessions. And so, as we said, our possessions, in some sense, are not really ours. They, they, they belong to God. But he's given them to us so that we can use them, watch over them, protect them, um, improve them, uh, and all, all the rest. We're our stewards of his possessions. And so, for, for example, I, I used to know some people that they lived out in the country, and uh, they lived on this big old piece of property that wasn't theirs. Uh, they didn't own it. Uh, they, they weren't even written it. In fact, they were getting paid uh, to live there uh, because the owners were paying these this couple uh, to live there in order to take care of the property. And so it belonged to somebody else, but they were stewards of the property. They mowed it and fed the animals and, and you know, uh, repaired, fixed the fences when they needed to be repaired, and did all the things, taking care of this property, even though it wasn't theirs. They had full use of it. Uh, they'd go four-wheeling and everything else. They, they used the property, uh, but they were stewards of the property. It didn't really belong to them. And in, in, a, in a very real sense, that's a, a, almost exactly what our possessions are like that belong to God. 
that we're to care for them, we're to be responsible for them, um, and, um, and, and, and all the rest. And so we've been given a stewardship, a binding stewardship uh, by God with all of our possessions. And then the next sentence here, it says, if you're following along, they are, meaning Christians, are therefore under obligation to serve him, meaning God, serve him with their time, talents, and material possessions. So those three things that I mentioned just a moment ago, their time, their talents, and their material possessions. And so we see, when we talk about stewardship, a lot of times people immediately start to think about money and your tithes and offerings. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But really, uh, rightly understand stewardship, it's everything. Our time, and everybody has the same amount of time, 24 hours in a day. That's how much God has given us. Everybody has the same amount of time. Um, how are we going to use that time for God's glory? Um, and we'll get to what we're supposed to use it for in a second, uh, for God's glory and helping other people. And so how are we going to use that time? And our talents, our abilities, how are we improving those talents and abilities? And how are we using them uh, for God's glory and to help others? And then our possessions, those things that we have, our money, our, our possessions, and, and, all, and all the rest. Now, let, let me make sure that you understand something. We're not only talking about using your time for God in the sense that well, you need to take some of your time and donate some of your time to volunteer at the church. Um, you can do that. That's great. That's wonderful. But that's not really what we're talking about here uh, uh, exclusively. Uh, that's part of it. That might be part of it. But how are you using a hundred? It's not 10% of your time and 10% of your talents and 10% of your money. Uh, you know, that's not what we're talking about. 100% of it all. How are we using that? Uh, for God's glory, because we've been given a stewardship over it. And I think some people misunderstand that, that you know, what they, what they uh, give to God, they'll use that terminology, what they put in the offering plate was what they give to God, and then the rest belongs to me. No, it all belongs to God. And so how we use our time is, is, is 100% of our time, 24 hours of the day, seven days a week, we ought to comprehend and understand that we ought to be taking account taking account of that time and using it 100% for God's glory. That doesn't mean 100% for ministry. You got to sleep, you got to eat, you got to work, and all of those things for you know in a proper understanding of what God has blessed us with as human beings and taking dominion over the earth and proclaiming the gospel and uh, raising up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. All of those things uh, go into glorifying God and helping others. And so we ought to be thinking about those that with everything that we do. Our abilities, you know, utilizing our abilities and, and honing our talents and our, our skills and our abilities that we always ought to be improving and thinking about how am I using this to glorify God? Uh, not not just not just directly for the church, you know, say you're a carpenter, uh, say you're a carpenter and, and we're needing some carpentry work done at the church right now. Um, say, say you have some carpentry skills. I'm not talking about just using your carpentry skills on the church building. That's good. That's helpful. That's fine. That's great. But I'm talking about using your carpentry skills in all of life to help others. How do you do that? By having a job, by building homes, by getting paid for that. You're contributing to society and you're using that for the glory of God. Do you see that the more holistic view of stewardship that we're wanting to uh, understand here? Because then it says, it says, and should recognize, so when you use your time, talents, and abilities, you should recognize that all these are entrusted to them to use for the glory of God and helping others. That's what I've been saying. Uh, for the glory of God and for helping others. And helping others, there again, let me make sure that I'm being specific. Um, helping others does not just mean donating your time to help others or donating your talents to helping others or donating your resources to help others. Should you be doing some of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't hear me arguing against that. Uh, absolutely, you ought to be doing that. What I'm saying is that's not the only way to do it. You're, you're, if you have a job and you're working at a plant or a factory or something like that, whatever you're, you're making, um, well, it's a job, right? And you're getting paid to do it uh, so that you can have money to provide for your family. 
But also, whatever that is that you're doing, you're helping society. You're help. You're bettering your community. Uh, you're you you know say you're making cars. You know you're giving up people vehicles uh, to to ride around in. Um, so you're you see what I'm saying is is we ought to be thinking in, in that way that everything that we do uh, should be directly connected to how is this uh, glorifying uh, to God. Um, and so using our time, sometimes I, I'll go ahead and say, sometimes you need some leisure time. Why? So that you can be more effective at other times. And so it all, it all fits together. It all fits together. It, the difference is you're either consciously doing it or sub or not unconsciously uh, doing it. And if you're consciously doing it, then it's worshiping to God. It's sanctifying your soul and all the rest. If you're unconsciously doing it, it's being wasted. You see, and you could be doing the same exact thing. But uh, th that's why we want to think about it, stewardship today in these regards. That everything we do is uh, for the glory of God and for helping others. Our time, our talents, and our resources. And then, and then the, the confession says, the Baptist faith and message says, according to the scriptures, Christians should contribute. Here's where we're getting to contributing. Uh, this is this is this part of it, uh, the last sentence that gives like five ways that we're to contribute. We'll look at each one of those as we contribute. And here's where we're talking about actually giving uh, money to the church, <laughs> you know, to put it bluntly, uh, money to the ministry of the gospel, uh, right? And so how should we be doing that? I mean, make sure you, we understand that, that uh, this is not, we're not talking about the portion that belongs to God. It all belongs to God. It's the portion that God is wanting us to use in a very specific way, and that is contributing to the work of the ministry. And so, how are we to do that? It, say, it says uh, in the Bible, if you look at all those passages of Scripture, by the way, um, I, I'll mention this, and I'll mention this every um, uh, session that we're doing the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, that if you follow the link in the description to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 at the Southern Baptist Convention website, uh, scroll down to article number 13 on stewardship. You'll see the text that we're going over right now. And then underneath that, there'll be scripture passages. Look up each one of those scripture passages. Uh, I, I did that just a, a, earlier today and won't, went through and read every single one of them and asked myself the question, in what way is this passage uh, talking about stewardship? Uh, how is it helping us to think through stewardship? And how did the, the authors of the, Southern Bap the Baptist Faith and Message get what they're saying out of that passage? Going through that exercise is going to really help you with each one of these articles in the Baptist faith and message. So look up those uh, passages of Scripture, um, because ultimately, Scripture is our final authority, uh, not, not this man-made man written document. It's the Scriptures. And this sentence says that the Scriptures do teach us this about contributing, that these that contributions um, should contribute from their means in these ways, cheerfully, regularly, systematically, uh, proportionately and liberally. So those five ways. Let's look at those five ways uh, together quickly. Um, first, first of all, it, sa it says that we should do it cheerfully. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver, right? That's what the Bible says. God loves a cheerful giver. Um, not a stingy giver, not a grudgeful, grunge, grudgeful giver, uh, but a cheerful giver. Now, now that doesn't mean you, you found a loophole. That's what one one guy one time told me. He said, um, "Well, when I give, I'm not very cheerful, folks. So I might as well not give." <laughs> I think he thought he had found a loophole. You know, uh, he's well, I'm not cheerful, so I'm not going to give. No, you need to give until you're cheerful. <laughs> uh, I remember when I was growing up, I had a pastor who uh, would would say, when everybody stand up to give the offering, he'd say, now reach into your, uh, the pocket of the person sitting in front of you and take their wallet and give like you've always wanted to give. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, he, he also, the same pastor uh, pointed out, and i never forget this, and I looked it up, sure enough, that word cheerful giver that the Bible uh, uses, the word God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful could could actually be translated hilarious, uh, joyful, hilarious, almost laughing uh, type of thing. And so uh, we can kind of understand that, God, what, you know what God loves? Is somebody that gives until it's like, okay, well, $1, that makes sense. But this much, 
that, that you know that that might hurt a little bit. This much, oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> and and you see, God loves a hilarious giver, a cheerful giver. So it's just like this almost doesn't make sense. Um, that that's that's what that's what the passage literally means. Literally means that God loves a cheerful giver. Now, you might be hearing that and, 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 and you might be saying, you know what? It does feel good to give. And you've experienced that. And you've been able to bless others or bless your church and see God, um, glorified through the work that your money does, uh, your resources do, or your time, talent, and abilities, uh, do. And you've been, you've been, uh, you've gotten a smile on your face and a blessing because of that. Uh, but perhaps, Perhaps you've never experienced that. And this sounds like crazy talk to you. Um, it's, it's like, that, that doesn't sound wise to you. Um, well, I, I would encourage you just to, to, to read, read those biblical passages and prayerfully consider how God would have you to, uh, to respond to your money and using those resources. One of the things that I kind of have in my mind, and, and I've kind of struggled, I had this idea years ago, and I've kind of struggled with, knowing if it makes sense to anybody else except for me. And, and here, here, here's what I kind of like to look at it. Sometimes I think people think of giving to the church, you know, as if you are, you know, an individual, this is my money, and I'm going to give it to somebody else, you know. And, and we have that thought process. Now I'm giving it to somebody else. Now I don't have it. Now they have it. I don't have it. Really, that shows a very weak understanding of the church. You, are, If you are a member of the church, you are part of the church. And so see if this makes sense. In a very real sense, you're not giving it away. You're using it in the way that you have decided to use it for your benefit. Because you're receiving a benefit. It's kind of like, let me see if I can use this analogy to see if it makes sense. Say you go to a restaurant. Your favorite restaurant, you love eating there. Uh, it's not very expensive because if it was overly expensive, the analogy wouldn't work because uh, you'd be griping about how expensive it is. Say it's a good price, it's good food, you're enjoying it. And so you're giving, you're, you're buying that for who? For yourself, for your own enjoyment, for your own pleasure, for your own benefit. I, I, wish, I wish some church members would think about that when they're giving to the church when they're contributing, when they're tithing and offerings, what they're really doing is benefiting themselves, not in a selfish way, in a good way, in a God-honoring way. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this money to, to, uh, in the offering, and what it's going to do is allow us to pay the electric bill and to provide a salary for the pastor who is, who is, who is feeding me in the word of God and, and caring for my soul and, and the fellowship that we enjoy. We're, we're, we're not giving the money to somebody else and it's gone now. No, it's for our own benefit. It, it, does that, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody but me, but um, I think it's a healthy way to look at it. And I think it might be a healthy way to help people think about being a cheerful giver. And so the verse is cheerful. Let's look at the rest of it. It says cheerfully and regularly, regularly, um, not sporadically, but regularly. Uh, there's a passage uh, in, Corinth, in, Cor in Corinthians uh, where the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth to bring their tithes and offerings um, every week, every week. So it ought to be regular. Um, he, sa he says so that there's no collection when I come. Um, there's a, there's a uh, bringing it regularly. It's part of our, it's actually part of our worship. I, I, I've actually told some people in our church um, that, and, and I've taught on this before, that uh, you may not get paid every week. You know, different people get paid in different ways, you know, depending on your salary and everything else. Uh, maybe maybe you get paid once a week um, and you're to take a portion of that. We'll get to proportion in a second, a portion of that. And you put it in every week. But what if you get paid every other week or only once a month or very irregularly like a contractor or something like that? You might get paid a big lump sum um, and, and, then, and then you don't get paid again for weeks, you know. So something like that. Well, whatever the case, I think, I believe that it's wise, and I think this is consistent with Scripture. It's not a command, but it's, I think it's a wise thing to, to um, save out some of that so that you can give something every week, so that you can give something every week, so it can be regular and systematic. Um, and the reason why, and here's, the, here's my reasoning why, and it's actually a different topic, but it's about worship. 
that I believe that worship is one of the elements of, I mean, uh, giving is one of the elements of worship. And so when we meet for worship, we're to sing, we're to pray, we're to read the scripture, we're to preach, we're also to collect, take up offering. And so uh, when you are worshiping and you're putting money in the offering plate, that is not just a physical thing, you know, I'm paying an electric bill, you know, putting in my dues, you know, that kind of thing. No, it ought to be an act of worship. And there's different things that you can think about, and I won't take the time to give them all, but there's a few different things that you can think about at different times when you're giving the offering. You might need to come to the place where you say, you know what, I could really use this for something else, but because I have faith that God is going to take care of me, I'm going to give, you, you see. And so it, it, there's a there's a sanctifying work that's taking place when you're doing that. Or you're, 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 you're specifically or um, intentionally setting your priorities, that worship and the church and God's business is a priority in my life. And when you write that check or put that money in, in the offering, that you're intentionally thinking through that prioritization of your life. And in that sense, it becomes an act of worship, you, you see. And so that's why I think that being, being regular with your giving, even if your pay is not regular, being regular in your giving and the more irregular your pay is, like if you're a contractor or something like that that I was saying, um, hopefully you've understood the importance of making a budget because your electric bill comes every month and uh, you have other bills every month and you got to budget things out. Well, you, you got to do your offering in the same same way, same way, right off the top. And so um, uh, cheerfully, regularly, systematically, and proportionately, proportionately. Uh, the Apostle Paul uses, talks about this in Corinth, and you can look up the scripture references as well, proportionately. That means a percentage, a percentage. Now, this opens the cold can of worms about tithing, um, and whether the tithe should be 10%. Um, and then there's people who want to say, is it 10% of your net, 10% of your gross? And I ask all those questions. Notice the word tithing is not in the Baptist faith and message, probably intentionally so, but they do use the word proportionately. And so I'm asked the question all the time, do you believe the Bible teaches that Christians should tithe? That's one of those questions where I hesitate to just give a binary yes or no answer. And, and here's why I, I, I hesitate to just say yes or no. Because the issue is not just the, the, the percentage amount. It's the attitude of the heart. It's the motivation. And so if we circumvent the attitude, if we go around in the discussion, the motivation, and don't talk about the attitude of heart, don't talk about the motivation, don't talk about the, the reasons for it all, and you just say yes or no, you miss the point. Does that make you see what I'm saying? You miss the point. And so I don't, I don't like doing that. However, uh, let me take the, the time uh, a few minutes. I don't want to take this too long because this is this could could really be a uh, in depth study in it of itself. But uh, let me deal with a few things about tithing very quickly. Um, one is I, I, I sometimes hear the objection uh, to tithing. Uh, very, very. I, I notice people get real emotional about this su su subject for some reason. I mean, you can talk um, in pa unpassionately about all sorts of other things, but you get to tithing, boy, people start to hold on to their wallet and they start getting emotional about it. Um, and so don't get emotional about it. Let's just see what does the Bible say? That's what we as Christians want to know, right? And so uh, sometimes when people get emotional about it and they start to push back and they say, tithing, tithing, that was in the Old Testament. Uh, we're, we're in the New Testament. We're in the New Covenant. We don't, we don't have to deal with uh, Old Testament anymore longer. And I'm like, oh, oh, hold on, wait a second, wait a second. Every time somebody says that was in the Old Testament um, and want to completely disregard it, I want to say, hold on a second. Is that really how we interpret the Bible? Uh, let me remind you, the Old Testament is still part of the Bible, just so you know. And there's a lot of things in the Old Testament we cannot just dismiss and act as if they don't exist anymore. I mean, the Bible, the, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not murder. Is it okay to murder now? The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Is it okay to commit adultery now? Uh, the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Is it okay to steal now? The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Is it okay to lie now? You, you see what I'm saying? And so, no, you, you can't just say, oh, that was Old Testament. We don't have to do that anymore. Blah, blah, blah. No, hold on. We have to rightly understand what the old, how to, to interpret the laws of the Old Testament. Uh, now, I've, thought, I've literally thought about writing a book on this topic, and so if this is 
giving you too much information all at once. I apologize. But in, in order to understand the laws of the Old Testament, you have to understand that the laws of the Old Testament basically fall into three different categories. There are ceremonial laws, there are moral laws, and there are civil laws. The ceremonial laws, those are the laws about the sacrifices and all the rest. Um, and those laws have been fulfilled in Christ. You know, Christ is our Passover. So that's why we don't have sacrifices anymore, because Christ has fulfilled those things. Um, and so we, we don't have to sacrifice anymore. We, that's what the, author, the book of Hebrews is pretty much all, almost all about, is those things are, are done away with because Christ is our sacrifice, right? So the ceremonial laws uh, don't exist anymore. The moral laws, or they've been fulfilled in Christ, the moral laws do indeed still exist. Uh, the, ten, the moral laws are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, those moral laws, were moral laws even before Moses got them off the Mount Sinai. It was wrong to murder even before Moses came down off the top, off the top of the mountain with the two tablets of stone. Okay, uh, and still to this day, it is still wrong to murder. Just so you know. Um, okay, so the moral laws are still in effect, and now there's different ways to to they, they function today, but that'll have to be another sermon for another day. Um, but the moral laws are still in effect. But the civil laws, the civil laws of the Old Testament, and there's lots of them throughout the, the Old Testament. These civil laws, those are the laws that were given specifically to the commonwealth of Israel, the, 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 the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant nation of Israel, for them to operate. These are all those, those laws that we read about in Leviticus and, and, um, and, um, and, and all the rest that are not the ceremonial laws, just the regular everyday civil laws um, about all sorts of things. Well, many of these uh, tithing laws are in those civil laws. And by the way, the Old Testament, when we talk about tithing, there's more than one particular, one type of tithe. Uh, without going into all of it uh, today, um, and actually, if you add them all up, it comes out to about 30-something percent, <laughs> not just 10 percent, 30-something percent. So uh, take that for what it's worth. And so you have that in the civil laws. Now, how do we interpret the civil laws today? Or how do they transfer from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, from the uh, Commonwealth of Israel to the church today? Well, if we look at the Westminster, Baptist, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, I like the way that they word it is that those civil laws have been abrogated with the Commonwealth of Israel. Uh, they've been abrogated, but they come over today in their general equity, their general equity. And so it's, I like to call it the principle underneath it. And so it might not directly apply, but the principle applies. And especially the principle as it is connected to the moral law. And so what does that mean for tithing? That was just a quick understanding of the law. Now, what does that mean for tithing? The tithing of the civil law. Does it mean it's completely gone and has nothing to do with today? No, that's not what the New Testament tells us. Uh, that there's some general equity there. When the, so when the Apostle Paul talks about a percentage that is to be given, he doesn't mention a particular specific dollar uh, uh, percentage, but he does say it should be proportionate. It does say it to be proportionate. Now, Jesus does, in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, does say something very interesting about tithing. Remember when he's knocking heads with the Pharisees and he tells them that you tithe mint and, 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 and cumin. Uh, they're, they're tithing out of their spice rack um, because they wanted to make sure they fulfilled the Old Testament civil laws, right? And so they're tithing out of their spice rack or out of their little herb garden. If they have a, a mint and they pick 10 mint leaves and bringing one of them to the synagogue to uh, tithe, uh, right? And so they're wanting to do that. And you know what Jesus says? He kind of shakes his head at him and, and says, this you ought to have done, but not neglect the weightier matters of the law. And so he doesn't say you shouldn't have tithed. He says you should tithe, but don't, don't neglect the weightier matters of the law. In other words, tithing, that's elementary. That's kindergarten. Of course you ought to tithe, basically is what Jesus is saying. Of course you ought to tithe. But man, you ought to be doing lots more. There's so many more things that are so important. But of course, you should be tithing. And so that that's my take on it. I believe that, that, that tithing is biblical. Um, does it have to necessarily uh, legalistically be 10%? No. Uh, but it should be a proportion. And, and so 
And there should be some general equity there. And if you're going to church and they pass the offering plate and you pull out a dollar and throw it in the offering plate, like a little tip, I don't know how that one dollar could be general equity of, of 10% or 33% or whatever it might be. That's not, there's no, you know, there needs to be something, something there, uh, that it's a substantial percentage of our, uh, of our uh, money, our income ought to go to the work of Christ's church. Um, now what percentage that is exactly? It's going to, it's going to vary from person to person. Um, I would, I, I would challenge you to whatever you're giving now to see how you can, you can up it and, 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 and work toward that 10% while still being cheerful and regular and systematic and glorifying to God through it all. Uh, I, hope, I hope that's, how, and liberal, liberally. Notice that the next one was liberally. Proportionate was the uh, next to last one. Um, and liberally um, to give. Uh, so not stingy, uh, but liberally. You know, talking about the 10%, I'll mention one more thing uh, before I close uh, today. I was talking to a guy years ago, and he was really pushing back against that 10% business. And he said, I, I think 1% ought to be good enough. 1% ought to be good enough. Now, I can't remember how much I said. I usually one-on-one -on -one kind of bite my lip a little bit, bite my tongue a little bit. And um, it just so happens the same guy, follow this story. The same guy hated big churches. He did not want to go to a big church. He didn't go to a big church. He went to a small church. And uh, he, he was really against big churches, and, um, and which is fun. I, I'm not a big fan of huge churches either. You know, uh, He didn't want to go to a church where you didn't know everybody, which... I think that's fun. If if your church gets so big that you don't know everybody, I, I think there's nothing wrong with splitting into two, three, four churches. You know, plant plant new churches. Um, but anyway, whatever the case, he, he didn't like big churches. He didn't want a big church. But at the same time, he said that his tithe ought to be, you know, one percent ought to be good enough. Now, at the risk of sounding unspiritual, let's do the math. Think about it. If everybody in your church, if every family in your church only gave 1%, 1%. It would take 100 families in order for the church budget to meet the average income of your church family. You see what I'm saying? So 100, 1% from each family. It would take 100 families in order for the church budget to be the average of the income of your church, Right? And so if you have 100 families and every family has two or three people, we're talking two, 300 people already. And that's just for the church budget to be um, the average income of your families. But a church, remember, one of the biggest expenses, especially of a small church, um, is the, the, uh, the salaries, you know, or a salary for the pastor. Even if you only have one person, the one pastor's uh, salary, um, that's usually a big chunk of it. And so let's say it's half. And so then you would need not 100 families, given 1%, you'd need 200 families, 1%. Now, now all of a sudden you're four, 600 people. You, that's, no, that's not a small church anymore, is it? Uh, not, not at all. Um, and so, and so you, you might want to think about what if every other family in the church gave the same amount that I do? How, how would we be financially doing? Um, it's just something to think about. I'm not t saying that to put a guilt trip on anybody. I'm not saying that to try to twist anybody's arms. I I'm, I'm just wanting, wanting to help you and, and, and for you to glorify God uh, with your uh, resources um, and, and use that. Uh, some, some people have said, I'm not going to tithe my money. I'm going to tithe my time instead. Um, well, well that, that sounds good, but you know what? The electric company isn't going to take that <laughs> for, the, for the church, you know? So I can't, as a pastor, I can't tell the electric company and say, well, you know, I had a lot of people volunteering this week of their time. Um, well, unless you're, you know, turning a generator crank, uh, to make the lights stay on, uh, that's really not going to do it. It takes money. I hate to say it. I told you I didn't like to talk about money, uh, but it does take money to operate. It does take money to live. It does take money uh, to pay the bills. It takes money to do things. Um, it takes money to, and this is to, to finish out the Baptist faith, the message to advance the advancement of the Redeemer's cause on earth. Cause that's really what we're trying to do. 
And we're going to advance the Redeemer's cause on the earth. We're not trying to just get your money. Um, we're trying to advance the, the Redeemer's cause on the earth and conform our heart uh, to Christ's heart and live in tune with what he has for us. And if we do that, and if we're faithful, I believe God's going to take care of us. I believe God's going to take care of us. And so that everything that we do might bring honor and glory to God, glorifying God and helping others with our time, our talent, and our resources that we're to give uh, cheerfully, regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally for the glory of God and for helping others. And I hope this uh, study has been helpful for you today. I pray that you have a good week, and I'll see you at church.